So it is my uh, great pleasure to introduce Jürgen Schmidhuber, who, whose ambition since the age of 15 has been to create an AI that's more intelligent than himself and then retire. Thank you so much. Um, this is the cover that I made for my first publication ever, my diploma thesis 30 years ago, 1987. It was all about meta-learning. I wanted to solve the grand problem of AI by building something that not only learns a little bit here and learns a little bit there, but also learns to improve the learning algorithm itself and also the way it improves the way it improves the learning algorithm and so on recursively, recursive self-improvement without any limits except for the limits of computability and physics. And, um, and this is my name and how to pronounce my name. And uh, the basic approach is always the same. In principle, we are doing similar things that, uh, as what we did uh, back then. Uh, you start with a general purpose computer, and you have a universal programming language that allows you to implement arbitrary learning algorithms. And then you um, need some sort of force that makes sure that the learning algorithms that you are testing are getting better and better over time. And back then um, I used a concept which was um, first published by Kramer in 1985, genetic programming, which is just genetic algorithms applied to programs. But then I said, okay, let's have a second level on top of the basic level, which um, allows the system to search the space of arbitrary uh, new learning algorithms that can combine um, existing knowledge and existing programs in new, better ways, in arbitrary, computable ways. And then on top of that, another level, and so on, recursively. And um, uh, this was rather general compared to what you often see today, because um, many of the things that are called meta-learning today, I would probably um, uh, prefer to call transfer learning. For example, you have a deep neural network, um, convolutional network, and you train it on 100 different tra um, data sets, image uh, data sets, but then um, you um, take one more data set, and of course it is going to learn the new one much more quickly than the old ones, um, because it already has learned so much about vision from the previous data sets. So that is not, in my point of view, real learning to learn or meta-learning. Why not? Because the system is still stuck with the same basic algorithm, which in that case is uh, backprop. And, um, and, and so uh, you want to go beyond that. A radical uh, learning to learn is really cl about closing the loop. Uh, as you have a universal um, computer that allows for computing arbitrary learning algorithms, you want to make it self-referential such that, such that the system has an opportunity to inspect its own learning algorithm and make it better in, without any limits. So uh, this is an example here in the neural domain where I would not say that this is meta-learning, although some people would say that. What you see here is a slow network to the left and you see um, a fast weight network to the right. And that was from 1992, and it's end-to-end -end differentiable. It's processing sequences, and the slow network learns to very quickly adjust the weights of the fast network. And that's how it um, can learn to solve problems where you have to memorize stuff. So the fast weight network is like a, a memory, an external memory that is controlled by the slow network. Now. Um, this is uh, kind of cool, but if that is um, meta-learning just because there's one network that is learning to control another one, one or the parameters of another one, then all of uh, LSTM also would be meta-learning because in LSTM you do have a fast weight, at least since 1999, since um, my second PhD student, LSTM PhD student, Felix Geers, introduced these four get gates. Um, the, the gated recurrent units as they are sometimes called now. So here we see a fast weight which is controlled by a part of the LSTM. And all the time, if you have a large um, network with many LSTM cells, then of course uh, a substantial fraction of uh, that whole network is fast weights that are being 
trained or quickly adapted by, um, by a slow part of the network. And if that is meta-learning, then all of these applications like Google Translate and Facebook Translate and, and what Apple is doing and QuickType and so on, they would also all be meta-learning. I don't think they are meta-learning. Uh, here is a real meta-learning system, at least a supervised um, meta-learning system, not fully general, not reinforcement learning, but um, at least self-referential. This is from 1992 or so 1993. You have a recurrent network and you want to make it self-referential such that it can run arbitrary learning algorithms on itself. So we know that it, a recurrent network can run arbitrary algorithms, including learning algorithms, but we have to set it up such that it really can express um, this power. And then what we do is we give it um, a bunch of output units to address any of its own weights. Suppose you have 1,000 units in your network, then you have 1 million uh, connections if everything is connected to everything, which means you need about 20 units to, bin to address in binary fashion every single weight, weight number 576. You need an extra output unit to say, okay, change now very quickly the value of this weight of myself from uh, 0.5 to minus 7.6 or something like that. Then you need a couple of additional output units to address um, the weights that you want to read. So you have another 20 output units for doing that and you have an input where the system can see what's going on within itself. So it becomes introspective. Then you can do, the, you can make the whole thing differentiable and you have an end-to-end -end differentiable meta-learning system which you just train on a standard task but now it has the opportunity to come up with its own fast weight change algorithms running on itself a meta, meta, meta learning system in a certain sense. And what you really want to learn is the initial weight matrix, which tells the system how to uh, start this meta learning process, basically. And meta, meta, meta learning process. Now, back then, uh, not done with LSTM, but with RNNs, but with uh, standard RNNs, but um, just a couple of years later, Sepp Hochreiter in 2001, he well, he, maybe he didn't have a fully self-referential system, but he showed at least that one network can learn an, um, a learning algorithm on another recurrent network, so it was an LSTM actually, which learned to solve quadratic functions um, through a new learning algorithm, self-invented learning algorithms, uh, rhythm, 30 times faster than uh, background, what, which was the technique that was used to train the whole system. So things like that are possible. Uh, I thought this is really crazy uh, back then um, when I have 20 binary or near binary uh, units to uh, change all these connections um, sequentially. What are we humans doing? Well, we have learned to learn new languages. How do we do that? Well, we say, for example, um, we want to learn a certain word, say house, um, and um, we want to n learn the French translation, which is maison. So somehow we put house in our head, in our spotlight of attention, and a few seconds later, or milliseconds later, we put um, maison in our uh, spotlight of attention, and then that this forces our fast weights to associate these things together. I said, we can build that with recurrent networks too. So um, that was a, an alternative, better way of addressing um, through an outer product rule all these fast weights in a self-referential system like that. And the cool thing about that was that if you have 1,000 um, units and a million connections, normally if you have no fast weights, then you um, uh, have a really bad ratio between the slow variables, the, the things that you train, and the time varying um, variables. It's a 1,000 to 1. If every f connection can also be used as a fast weight, then the ratio is 1 to 1, much better. Uh, a similar paper was there last um, last year at NIPS 2016, and there is one here tomorrow, I think, at the NIPS Meta Learning Workshop, and it's by Immanuel Schlag, my PhD student. He has a more complicated fast weight system, which is more practical in certain sense, uh, senses, and, and you might want to check that out. Now, fast weights can also be used to um, reinforcement learn things, and um, and that's uh, what Faustino Gomez showed um, in 2005 uh, with uh, robots that reinforcement learned uh, to do rather complica complicated things back then. And uh, he used fast ways to, to achieve that, uh, to learn deep 
memory PomDPs, where you had to memorize stuff for a long time. Um, one important, interesting concept um, that you, is not meta-learning by itself, but can be used to build practical meta-learning systems is you um, collapse what one network has learned into another network which has already learned lots of other things. And, uh, and that's uh, what we did in 1992. So a recurrent network uh, is trained to do something. In that case, it was prediction, trying to compress sequences by predicting them. And then um, another network learned something else which the first network couldn't do. And then um, the first network was able to imitate the higher level network and was able to collapse its behavior into itself while being retrained on the previous stuff. So um, that is something that you ha um, often see now in, um, in cloning policies, as it is called, or distilling networks. Back then it was not called distilling it, but it was called um, um, uh, collapsing one net into another or compressing it. Let me now come to the thing that really gave the title to, title to this present um, talk, which is the same title that I used in 1994 um, for learning how to learn learning strategies for this tech report. And it's doing lots of things that I'm not yet seeing in today's meta-learning systems. Um, it has a single trial, a lifelong trial, and all the intermediate trials are, are actually part of this one lifelong trial. And what is happening there? The system is a probabilistic programming language, could also be a recurrent network, but back then it was something else. And then it learns to um, change itself, change the probabilities of its own instructions given um, the positions of instruction pointers and so on. And there it can implement arbitrary learning algorithms. And now obviously it's the case that whenever it changes its own learning algorithm in the beginning of its life, this has an impact of what happens next uh, on later learning algorithms. And how do you make sure that the learning algorithm, uh, the self-referential, self-modification algorithm is getting better and better over time? Well, there's a particular instruction that the system can execute, which is called the checkpoint instruction. Whenever it um, executes the checkpoint instruction, then, um, then, then, uh, the success story algorithm kicks in. What is that? It uh, is an algorithm that keeps track, track of all the self-modifications of the system over time, and it always measures, did I get more reward per time since the last checkpoint uh, than during all the checkpoint intervals before? So uh, that's something that makes sure that you always have a reward per time acceleration. And to the extent that this condition doesn't hold at a certain point in time, you undo the self-modifications that were executed by the system itself, which means you need something like a stack to keep track of the previous self-changes, and only the good ones survive. And so you get then a stack which gets deeper and deeper, and um, in any, at any moment of its life, however, the system is still ready to, um, to consider the possibility that something that happened at the very beginning of its own life was responsible for what's now going wrong and stuff like that. So it is really doing lifelong credit assignment through a single lifelong trial. And this is what, in principle, you have to do if you want to do the real meta-learning where you take into account the effect of early learning algorithms uh, onto later algorithms. So here are a couple of pictures which illustrate the operation of the uh, system. And this is an, an old example where uh, two agents equipped with that system learn to solve over a rather complicated task where you had to um, find a key and then open a door and one of the agents had to go in and grab another key and open another door and open it. And, um, and uh, the whole life back then was long by the back then standards because computers were so slow back then. Uh, 10,000, 100,000 times slower than today. But it was able to look back over its uh, four billion step life or whatever and uh, do the credit assignments such that it really came up with really stable learning uh, and self-modification algorithms. Then somebody is now telling me I have only one minute left, so I just say <laughs> that we then went crazy and tried to find optimal self-modification algorithms, and that is the Gödel machine, and I don't have any time anymore to talk about the Gödel machine, but um, let me at least mention one important thing. Um, 
if you just have these user-given, teacher-defined tasks, then uh, there is a lot of freedom that you don't exploit, in, uh, which you can give to freedom, uh, which you can give to systems that may invent their own goals and their own tasks and um, may invent their own experiments uh, to figure out how the world works like little babies do. Most of the time they invent their own little goals and try to solve these self-invented problems and uh, the good thing is that many of these self-invented problems are much easier than uh, what you get from your parents, the problems that other people um, and other users um, hand to you. So you want to um, become a more and more problem, a more and more general problem solver by playing around and um, inventing the easiest problem that has a solution which you uh, didn't know before, but such that none of your previously learned skills gets um, weakened or deleted or forgotten. And power play is a general way of um, achieving that. Here is a little robot that um, uses a restricted version of power play to learn from raw vision to just through playing um, one new skill after another um, based on its experiments that it's inventing by itself. Um, both our academic lab and our um, uh, commercial lab, Nasens, are hiring. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>